let's start. Let's start. Room 101. Art history room 101. I asked you what you would like to put in room 101 art historically. So we're going to do things a little bit differently today. I'm going to leave comments on. So if you think of anything as we go along, um, then please type furiously and let me know. Uh, <coughs> um, and I will be very interested to hear your comments. Um, so the first thing, so well, first of all, actually, Room 101, where does that come from? It comes from, as I'm sure all of you know, but just in case you don't, uh, it's, it's worth repeating, comes from 1984, George Orwell's fantastic dystopian novel, um, post-Second World War novel that uh, is really, uh, it's, a, it's a warning against, um, or it's a, it's a tribute, I suppose, to the, the, the democratic uh, democratic states as a warning against uh, um, well both fascism and communism I think basically so room 101 was the room the worst room in the world the room that you never wanted to go to room 101 um, because that's where you would face your worst Fears. If you haven't read 1984, and I'm fairly sure that most of you will have done, or not all of you will have done, um, then definitely read 1984. So Room 101, what would we consign art historically to Room 101? First one, first one up, well I say, and I can't, I do get it actually, I get, in fact, I get all of them. Um, first one up, Mona Lisa. The most famous painting in the world, the Mona Lisa, consigned to room 101. Um, why? Well, yes, so the person that mentioned this, and I'm not going to mention any names, but the person that mentioned this said, because there are more interesting paintings. Leonardo da Vinci did more interesting paintings, and he cited a uh, lady with an ermine and something else. Um, but yes, that's absolutely true. I think the issue with the Mona Lisa, so why has it become a, a, a Room 101 painting? I think it's not necessarily perhaps the painting itself, but all of the talk around the painting, isn't it? So here we go, actually. So here's the Mona Lisa. I've got it. Here we go. Here's the Mona Lisa. So yes, all the talk around the painting. Um, why is it so famous? Like, and honestly, I think probably that is the question that many art historians would like to put into Room 101 rather than the painting itself. Why is the Mona Lisa so famous? It's kind of the perfect storm. And maybe I'll do a different, um, maybe just because someone's put it in Room 101, I'll do, a, I'll do a whole separate episode on the Mona Lisa. It's, it's a mixture. Um, so the, the, the background is, is very intriguing Leonardo da Vinci um, when he painted this well he and who knows when he painted this he, he started uh, we think sort of somewhere around 1503 um, was probably sort of completed in 1506 but as far as I recall it spent most of Leonardo for all of Leonardo's lifetime or most of his lifetime in his um, yeah, when did he die? Anyway, in, in his studio. So he was probably tinkering on it as late as 1527. Um, and, and, so, and so this there's this whole thing about your eyes are drawn to the background and you're trying to make sense of it. And it's all, it's all quite enigmatic. And of course, there's the bloody smile. Is she smiling? Yes, she is kind of smiling. What's her secret? Blah, 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 blah. Um, but I think the thing that made it famous... Um, was nothing so much to do with the painting itself, but to do with the circumstance. So for ages, it was um, in you know, Leonardo's workshop and then in a private collection. Um, and then it was bought by Francois I, which is how it ended up going to France. Um, and was um, and so you know very few people were able to see it but it was a talked about painting because Leonardo hadn't actually done very many portraits and he certainly hadn't done many of women. I think there's four perhaps portraits of, of women uh, completed by Leonardo da Vinci. So it was, you know, it was something that was, it was a painting that people wanted to see. But then in 1911, it became super famous because by then it was hanging in the Louvre and it was nicked, it was stolen from the Louvre. Um, and people would queue up to see the empty space in the Louvre where it had 
been. So obviously, you know, it had captured the public's imagination by then. But then um, it turned out several years later that the person that had nicked it was actually, um, I think it was a conservator or something. He worked at the Louvre, I think, I think in, the, in the conservation department. Um, and he'd taken it off the wall one night and was like sneaking downstairs with it. And, and the door was locked. <coughs> Excuse me, the door was locked, so we couldn't get out. So what happens is that one of the security guards recognises him and obviously doesn't notice the big package under his arm. Actually, the Mona Lisa isn't very big, so maybe that's another reason why it needs to get consigned to room 101. Um, it's quite, you're like, oh, is that it? Oh, now it's behind bulletproof glass and all the rest of it. If you manage to steal that, then you'd be doing very, very well indeed. Um, so, so yeah, so he meets, so he's going down the stairs with this package or whatever under his arm, um, presumably hidden, and spots the security guard, and the security guard's like, hi, all right, um, and opens the door for him and lets him out. So that sort of adds to the myth, doesn't it? Um, and, um, yeah, and he, it, it turned out that he was Italian and he, wanted, and he felt that it belonged back in Italy um, and he kept it hidden for a couple of years and then eventually went to um, to have it valued for a sale or something. He, he eventually thought very mistakenly that it would be safe um, to, to bring the work back out into the light and uh, he was wrong. He was wrong. Um, got arrested. So that's um, that's a potted history of the Mona Lisa. But yeah, Mona Lisa, she is in room 101. As are, um, as are Rubens, well, not really Rubens nudes, um, but I quote those very troubling, knobbly, wobbly, boobs. I was going to say tits, it wasn't that, it was boobs. <laughs> so Ruben's boobs are according to somebody else also in room 101. Um, so this apparently is very upsetting for, for, for one of Beyond the Palette's viewers. Um, yeah, I kind of get that. Um, so this is Ruben's Three Graces from probably 1635, somewhere around there. Uh, definitely after 1630, um, because I've said it before, um, so if you've just joined, we're talking about troubling knobbly boobs. Um, and yeah, so I've said it before, basically, when you get very, what we would now call Rubenesque women in Rubens' paintings, that's probably after 1630, because 1630 was the year he married his second wife, uh, Hélène Formont, who he absolutely adored. She was 30 year, 32 years his junior, uh, and so she was, she would have been the model for, for all of these. So what Hélène Formont's boobs looked like in real life um, is, well, it's nobody's guess, because there they are, really. Um, so here's a, perhaps an even more troubling one, and I'm gonna say that I agree with this. This is quite an interesting image. Um, so this is Venus, Mars, and um, Cupid. Oh, Mars, I've got the head of Mars. Look, there we go. Um, so, um, and Mars, actually, if you could see his head, is looking quite troubled by this, um, by this, this scene, which isn't surprising because, like, who breastfeeds like that? You know, Venus might be a goddess, but really she needs to up her maternal skills, which I think we all know weren't uh, particularly marvellous. Um, but yeah, that again, this this Rubenesque breast um, being squeezed, um, especially um, squeezing milk into Cupid's mouth. I get that. So this is in room 101, Rubenesque bosoms, um, as are a different type of bosom. Um, oh, same asset, oops, choose different. There we go, there we go. Good old Michelangelo. So this is, I mean, who knew that room 101, the, the first three artists mentioned Da Vinci Rubens and Michelangelo, or Michelangelo. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, what are they? Ice cream scoops, I don't know who coined that phrase, but they were very right. A pair of scoops of ice cream. Um, so Leonardo, um, sorry, Michelangelo wasn't, I think we can quite obviously see, or perhaps not obviously, but we can see that he wasn't working from a female nude, he was working from a male nude and just added a couple of blobs on her chest. Um, this is um, the Medici tomb in Florence. Um, so this is the figure of night on the Medici tomb about 1520s, 1527, I think, perhaps. Um, so troubling tits in room 101. Okay, so now from the from the merely disturbing to, I have to say, the utterly, in some people's minds, pretentious. How about this? Should we sit and contemplate the glory of Rothko? Well, according to some of you, absolutely bloody not. Abstract Expressionism, um, Rothko has been mentioned. This is, um, this is a painting that is in the Tate Modern um, here in, in London. Uh, I think it's called Black or Maroon, um, all created in um, 1958. Uh, but hilariously, oh, hilariously, is it hilarious? I don't know. This this is the context in which this series of, I can't remember how many paintings there are, there's, um, I don't know, say six, um, paintings all sort of relatively similar. Um, so, yeah, um, created within the, the, the context, there were actually a commission for the Seagram restaurant, um, or Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building in New York. Very, very shishi, very swanky restaurant. And Rothko painted the, <laughs> these paintings um, basically with the intention of making the diners sick. He didn't enjoy the idea that wealthy diners were going to um, enjoy their excesses um, in, in front of his works of art because he felt that his works of art deserved more dedicated viewing and if people were obviously eating and drinking and God forbid chatting in front of them then that was no good at all. So he actually, <laughs> he created them um, so that they, yes, they, they, they wouldn't go down well with diners and indeed they didn't and that's actually a whole other story and I am going to do that in, um, in, in a different elevenses. So things like Rothko, so you know, are you one of those people that sits and meditates and sort of finds their vibrations move you or do you look at them and go, mm, yeah, what's all that about? Um, perhaps even more particularly things like this one. Uh, this is in the Tate as well, I think. Um, another example of abstract expressionism, which was a movement that um, was, uh, was largely confined to the East Coast, in particular New York, um, in sort of the, the, the 1950s. And, uh, and this is a work from, a, I think actually 1950, um, by an artist called Barnett Newman. Um, obviously it's called Adam and Eve. Would you Adam and Eve it? Uh, yeah. And it's something about um, new beginnings, which you wouldn't necessarily get from the work, would you? Uh, so Barnett Newman suggests that you stand a certain distance away from the work so that it fills your vision and he suggests and again actually do you know what? I'm going to do an 11s is on this because it is quite the, the philosophy oh my god I'm sounding like my particular room 101 moment anyway I'm going to move on to that um but uh yeah, yes, he he says that if you if you look at them then they can speak to you as a as a like a portrait so we might explore that a little bit further, um, which brings me neatly on to my particular 
my particular room 101 thing that has to go in room 101 for me and actually I don't think anybody else mentioned this but my room 101 moment is that wanky arty bollocks description stuff like you know um Oh, yeah, it's normally the descriptions that come with works like Barnett, Newman's, Adam and Eve, and not necessarily the um, the the words that the artist has written, um, but the words that are written around an exhibition or a particular work of art or a series of works of art. Um, I was reminded by a friend that went to the uh, abstract experience Expressionism exhibitions, can't even say it, uh, at the Royal Academy a few years ago. And there was some, should we call it arty bollocks writing? Um, that was particularly marvellous, actually. It was it was quite poetic, but it was uh, something like, I don't know, the, the liminal tumescence, luminescence. I it, was, it was just, it, it was it was brilliant I did take a photo I've lost the photo I don't know where that is if I ever find it I will share it um so whoever wrote that was as much of a poet as um as a, an art historian and perhaps that's the point I don't know but um but saying just say it like it is I mean although <laughs> confession time I once in <laughs> in a gallery tour I think I was writing my dissertation at the time the verbiage is more important than the work what nonsense yes I agree yes um, but I did once when I was um I, I I was in the middle of my dissertation I think and I was doing a gallery tour and um and I was trying to say something and, and I was and I, and I said I came out with the um ontological ambiguities I was like oh yeah that's ontological and the people I were with just looked at me and I said, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Like, so basically what I was trying to say is, yeah, you're not sure what it is. That's all I was trying to say. But I don't know, something just like mm, went off in my head and I became Sudi. And I did very quickly put myself in Sud's corner and I, I, I couldn't, yeah. Anyway, that was a moment. Um, so yeah, arty bollocks. If you want to hear some arty bollocks, actually there's a website called arty bollocks. Um, I did bring it up. Um, and you can generate your own arty bollocks, which is quite marvellous. What does this one say? Um, here we go. Explore, read all about it. Um, oh, I thought I could generate some, generate some bollocks. Here we go. My work explores the relationship between the body and UFO sightings with influences as diverse as Russo and Francis Bacon, new synergies are manufactured from both explicit and implicit narratives. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Um, so that is definitely my, in, my, in, in Room 101, along with, and I think, uh, Quisinia, you've, you've hit the nail on the head, you know, the, the verbiage more important than the work, concept, or conceptual art. Basically, in my view, if something has to be explained to the extent that it by itself really has no meaning or just can't be understood, I, I do have a slight problem with that. Okay, I, and having said that, I don't know, Marcel Duchamp amazing first person to do it kind of push the envelope again i think we might have to do it at elevens is um on all this all this stuff because there is sort of a bit more to explore but but yeah but generally speaking because at half the time the concepts aren't very good either so if you've got a concept that's a bit rubbish but then it has to be explained by arty bollocks i mean that's even more rubbish isn't it so yeah definitely those things are in remote 101 along with as one of you mentioned video art i think it all kind of falls into a bit of the same category doesn't it video art um quite tricky quite often again i have to cite myself i took myself while i was studying on a, a trip to camden art center quite an interesting place if you haven't been there um uh, because it's something had been recommended to me oh you've got to see this piece it's really really beautiful anyway 
so it was a, a piece of video art. So I go into Camden Art Centre, buy my ticket and everything, and I'm, like, I'm looking and I can't even remember what it was now. Um, and I go into the room and I'm like, <laughs> I say to the assistant, oh, excuse me, I'm looking for blah, blah, blah piece. Um, and they're like, yeah, you're looking at it. It's there. Um, and I, I can't actually really remember. I think it was just a bunch of trees being projected onto a wall, um, maybe sort of even in a corner or something, so the whole wall wasn't taken up. I don't, it was, I was, oh, lovely, thank you very much. Underwhelmed doesn't quite cover it. Um, so very definitely underwhelmed. So video art is also in room 101. I have one final thing. One final thing to consign to room 101. Um, terrible reproductions. And this, you know, this tin, I don't know, this is on eBay or Etsy or something, I found this image. Um, a product of its time, of course. Everything, you know, everything's of its time. But I, for years, thought I absolutely bloody hated Constable and, and especially the Haywain and I realise now looking at it it's in the National Gallery as well that um, it's a beautiful painting um, and it's just the awful reproductions you know the the the, the terrible colours that just the, just the awful reproductions um, that are particularly nasty and these sort of ubiquity um, so you know oh no, Monet, Monet posters, Monet posters, doctors and dentists and things, they're all supposed to calm you down, aren't they? So actually, again, for years, I thought I didn't particularly enjoy um, the, the water lilies or the garden at Giverny. Or I sort of did when I was 10 or something. And then sort of because I saw them everywhere, I was like, oh, it wasn't it was familiarity bred contempt a little bit and now I'm sort of coming back and, and appreciating the, uh, the 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 joy and the and the skill of them but um those awful awful reproductions the original sketch in the VA is astonishing which um are we talking about the constable um this you know most of these works they are they they I mean, well, definitely the, the, the Constable, Monet, and so on, those, you know, the, the ones that have been everywhere, um, that don't lend themselves to being everywhere. So Toulouse of the Trek. Oh, okay. So I have to go and see the original sketch in the, um, in the Victorian Albert. That's, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, is it Constable taught Delacroix to, uh, to paint clouds? Yeah, absolutely. Delacroix, absolutely loved Constable's Clouds and so um studied them. There we go. Um yeah, whatever I was saying, I don't know. Um ew. Dunno, don't know what I was saying. Um but yeah, cheap, horrible, nasty, ubiquitous posters, reproductions, blah, room one oh one. For me actually that's um that's another one of mine so that's all okay any more any more 101 moments um that you've thought of or have we covered it have we covered it oh um yeah see what well, he was a beautiful draftsman constable as well wasn't he so um there's so much to recommend it but it was just i don't know to me it was just the colours, I think, initially didn't bring me joy. Just the, the, the greens and the browns and, and, and so on. Um, I would put arty bollocks and rubbish reproductions in Ramona, but I'd definitely save Mona. <laughs> yeah, let's save Mona. Mona Lisa, I think, yeah, she needs to... I, like I said, I don't think, with the Mona Lisa, I don't think it's necessarily the painting itself I think it's more about the 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 package that now comes with her um, that she probably really didn't want. See the roots of impressionism, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and um, and romanticism. Um, so so Jalakwa, the great uh, romantic artist, um, sort of 
to, yes, you, you, you can. I think uh, Constable was definitely moving along with Turner um, towards the romantic, towards the impressionist um, styles of, of painting. You wouldn't put the knobbly Rubens boobs in despite your own personal aversion. Oh, so Rubens boobs, get, they get to stay, okay. How about um, Michelangelo's boobs? I think for me they've got to go because they don't represent anything, do they? <laughs> they do. Well, they do, they represent, and that's all you can say about them. In bodies that are so exquisitely rendered apart from the boobs, they have to go. Unless he was actually thinking to the future and thinking about implants because you know what I guess in years to come people might not find them so odd in fact probably even now we perhaps wouldn't find them so odd because um I think some people do have boobs like that don't know I'm not so much of a boob connoisseur that I could answer that question anyway the beautiful faces yes yeah Michael actually right okay Renoir's chocolate box news, yes, they can go in. They can go into room 101. But again, it's kind of, it's more about the reproduction because I, I don't love them, but that's just a style. So is it, the, is it the horrible reproductions or is it the actual style? And I think actually reading that again, I think you just don't like them. I don't have an image, unfortunately, but yes. The Renoir's chocolate box and it's pretty bad because they're chocolate boxy, aren't they? And it's just, uh, but I'm, and that's, um, you know, it would be like saying that you don't like Rococo or, or, or something, you know, it's, it's art of its time um, and to a different taste. Michelangelo's big muscles on ladies too, yes. But they did that too. So even Rubens, um, you know, back in the day before he had a, a female to, to, to copy from. But I think Michelangelo is probably one of the worst offenders. He just wanted to paint boys, didn't he? He just wanted to paint boys. He should have stuck to boys, men. Um, yeah. Oh, well, do you think we're more forgiving of stuff from the past than we are for things now? Um, just wondering out loud I think um, for myself I'm probably more dismissive and damning of, of more um, recent what I would call misdemeanors um, but perhaps perhaps all the misdemeanors from the past or the really bad ones have been filtered out I, I guess that's probably what's happened isn't it um, don't know anyway room 101 so we might save the Mona Lisa, <laughs> otherwise. Artie bollocks, video art, um, Michelangelo's boobs and muscles on women, um, obviously boobs on women. Um, what else do we have? Ab abstract expressionism. Um, yeah, bad reproductions. Room 101. There we go. Thank you very much for joining me. Do you know, I might, maybe I'll put, um, maybe I'll put a little voting thing, perhaps on stories, and you can vote for the, for the, for the biggest offender, which, which, um, which room 101 candidate um, or prisoner um, do, you, do you think should stay there the longest? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'll do that. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'll see you next week when we're going to continue with a bit of surrealism. Um, following on from last week's Archimboldo, um, the fruit face. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I feel like we do need to explore perhaps some of these arty bollocks things. <laughs> Let's just see. Let's see whether they're bollocks or not. Okay, have a good weekend everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining. Bye.